Uh, I do want to point out one intervention we haven't tested, although I was slightly involved in this project, and that's taurine. This was recently published in Science by Vijay Yadiv's lab at Columbia University. Um, and they have very, very solid data in this paper. Taurine levels go down with aging uh, pretty dramatically, and adding taurine back has a pretty robust effect on lifespan. Now, if you look on the right, you can see that, again, as I mentioned, taurine affects many or all of the hallmarks of aging. So I don't think, again, that's what that's telling us is the animal probably is younger biologically. Well, I don't think it's telling us a lot about mechanism. And so when you have a molecule like taurine, you have to go back and really try to understand what it's doing to affect longevity directly. And I think that's a challenge uh, Vijay's uh, trying to deal with right now. Um, taurine, by the way, is in a lot of your uh, energy drinks, and I think it's in Red Bull, actually. And so um, um, I've suggested he go to them to try to get more funding for the project. <laughs> um, but it's also widely used as a supplement. Um, and so our mouse protocol is a little bit different. Uh, we're starting around 20 months of age, uh, and we go to about 28 months. So we're not letting the animals go all the way to death. And I would argue that uh, survival is probably still one of the best ways to measure aging or if you're going to look at one uh, assay. However, there's a lot of advantages now to harvesting the mice. First of all, we want to engineer these mouse experiments to be more like human studies because the main reason we're doing them is to validate things that have been reported to affect aging that we can then move into human intervention studies with. Uh, and uh, survival is not a particularly easy outcome in humans to look at. Uh, so another advantage, as you've heard, is that when you can, you can harvest the mice, you can take all of the tissues, and we have an assembly line that collects pretty much all of the tissues from all of our interventions, uh, then we can go back and do much more mechanistic studies. So to look at aging, we're relying more on the frailty test by Susan Howlett, which we've had very good luck with using in the lab, and also a number of biologic clocks, including those derived from complete blood counts, uh, methylation, and other omic data. Uh, we also use uh, a range of behavioral and physiologic measures to see how the mice are behaving over time. Um, I want to point out, though, before I go on, that I, you know, I think that the, this is not an effort to replace or replicate the intervention testing program. The ITP program has been extremely successful and helped the field dramatically uh, move forward. Uh, and uh, it's, I'm hopeful that it continues to go on. I think it's very important for the field. We're taking a different approach. Uh, the, one of the advantages of this, though, is that it's much faster. And so we can start up to two, like, two of these a year and move more quickly. Uh, urolithin is one of the molecules, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but we have tons of data on this now. Uh, but it's one of the molecules that I feel very good about in terms of affecting longevity. This was originally reported by, reported by Johan Ower's lab and has been studied by a number of other labs. And among things that we try to repeat, there's some things we can't repeat, some things that look have slight effects. Your lithin seems to be very robust in our hands, so I would encourage people to think about that more in their research. Uh, we have a graduate student, Stephen Raj, who's working on this, and one of the things we've done is lifespan studies in a range of different organisms now, uh, and it works pretty robustly everywhere. It's already been reported to extend lifespan in worms. Uh, we find uh, very significant effects in flies in both sexes for longevity. Uh, this has been repeated by Wilhelm Bohr's lab as well. Uh, the, the, neither of these data are published yet. Um, we see uh, pretty strong effects on longevity in killifish. Uh, one of the exciting things now in Singapore is we have a, the killifish model up and running, and we think this is a very valuable way of looking at aging. This is a, in collaboration with another investigator, Ko Tong Wei. Uh, and uh, you'll see on the right there that there's lifespan extension by rapamycin and also by urolithin. And I'm not going to show much me mechanistic data on urolithin today, but if you look at the western blots down at the bottom, what you'll see is that urolithin also reduces mTOR signaling. And I just want to point out that the vast majority of interventions uh, that extend lifespan in one way or another affect mTOR signaling. And so we need to, I think, keep the mTOR pathway uh, really in the forefronts of our minds when we're thinking about studying aging. Uh, we also see a reduction in frailty. So this is the frailty index starting at 18 months of age on the left. Uh, and at two different doses of urolithin, uh, we see a reduction in frailty. 
Uh, the mice maintain their weight much better on urolithin, uh, and they also have better rotor rod uh, or treadmill performance function as well. So uh, there are a number of different health span parameters that are benef benefited by urolithin A. Uh, I want to, before I go on to Jim Fibrizo, which is the main thing I want to talk about, uh, I will also say that um, urolithin is, uh, um, we've done a lot of mechanistic studies. We think now that we have a target for urolithin that may be uh, underlying these longevity phenotypes. And so I'm not really going to spend much talk about this uh, today publicly, but if you're working on urolithin, we're happy to talk about collaboration and, and discuss more. Uh, I also want to point out in these longevity studies, this is a recent one, uh, looking at gemfibrazil, glycine, alpha-ketoglutarate, and urolithin, all of which we see reduction in frailty. But uh, there's differences both in terms of sex and dose um, and you heard about this already, many of the longevity studies are being done at only one dose. Uh, and uh, that's really, uh, uh, we've done that in the past, I understand why it's done, but it's a kind of a shot in the dark. If you get a negative result, um, it's really difficult to say that uh, you, the, the compound does not work, it's just that that dose it doesn't work. Also, if you get a positive result, you don't know whether that's the optimal dose. So we've tr gone to using at least two doses in our intervention studies now, which is still relatively small, although it's, uh, we're limited by resources as well. Um, and so an example um, would be uh, glycine, which reduces frailty in females and not males in our hands, uh, or urolithin, which reduces frailty in males but not females in our hands. Now we need to repeat these again. We've got another study set up and running uh, to make sure all of this repeats, but the general uh, observations are that things are very sex specific and that's not a surprise to people that do longevity studies. The vast majority of interventions are sex specific or at least uh, have enhanced effects in one sex over another. I still think that's a major area of research that we're not uh, focusing enough on at this point, uh, and so we need to look, do that in more detail. If you look at gemfibrozil in both doses in females, you see about a 40% reduction in frailty. Uh, we see a no number of other parameters that are, that are improved as well. Uh, and I, I want to come back to this point of instead of looking only at hallmarks being affected, we need to understand targets of drugs. And I mentioned with urolithin, we have a putative target now that could underlie a lot of the benefits we see. And gemfibrozil, uh, we went back and tried to find targets for as well, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the assay we use is a, a thermal shift assay with proteomics, and it's based on the principle that when a drug binds to a protein, it stabilizes it. it and so you can raise the temperature of an extract, and proteins that denature aggregate and fall out of the solution. If the drug binds to a protein, it will keep it uh, soluble for a higher temperature, and then you can find that by proteomics. Uh, we love this approach. We've used it two or three times now, and I think it's been successful every time we used it. Uh, so more about Jim for Brazil. Um, so this is a fibrate, or at least it's reported to be. Uh, it's been in the clinic for a long time. It's off patent, uh, and it's used for hypertriglyceridemia, hyperlipidemia, uh, it's been a relatively successful drug. It's still being sold by seven different companies. Uh, and this was the initial data that got people excited, or one of the key findings, uh, key studies at least, where you see a reduction in triglycerides with uh, people taking gemfibrozil and also an increase in HDL. Um, and so this drug has been on the market, as I said, a long time. And the proposed mechanism of action is that it binds to a transcription factor called PPAR alpha and dissociates that transcription factor from repressive complex in the cytoplasm, allows it to go to the nucleus and activate transcription. Uh, so we've been working on this for a while now. Uh, Chong He was at the Buck Institute and uh, worked as a postdoc in my lab. And Shermaine is the fantastic grad student in Singapore, just about to get her PhD, working on the project now. So this all uh, looked great. Uh, other fibrates appear to do this, by the way. And one of the things that we found is that when we tested other fibrates, unlike gemfibrozil, they did not affect lifespan. And so uh, that led us already to think that gemfibrozil might be doing something different. I should point out, I'm not going to show this today, that gemfibrozil extends lifespan in worms and in yeast, and also improves health span in worms. So. Uh, this is another conserved longevity effector, and we now have the mouse data that I showed you. 
So we did the thermal shift assay and we found a protein that might be a target uh, for Jim for Brazil and that was PEPT1. Uh, before I talk about PEPT1, let me just say that PPAR alpha did not come out of the thermal shift assay. We see no activation of PPAR alpha targets with uh, physiologic levels of gemfibrazil. And if you look in the literature, the binding constant for gemfibrazil and PPAR alpha is about 300 millimolar, which is something you're never going to achieve in an in vivo situation. So uh, that and a whole lot of data I'm not going to show you today has convinced us that PPAR alpha is not e even a target of gemfibrazil, much less the one that's relevant for longevity. Instead, what we find is PEPT1, and you can see on this slide that when you increase the temperature in the presence of the drug, the protein is, remains soluble and does not aggregate. So that's the basis of this assay. Um, and uh, so what is PEPT1? So this is a, uh, a dipeptide transporter in the gut. It's expressed in enterocytes. Uh, and it accounts for about 60% of your amino acid uptake in the gut. Every, we, you do have individual amino acid transporters, and people like to think of the world as a pristine environment where your gut is, has all the different 20 amino acids floating around and different amino acid trans, transporters take them up. And to some extent, that's true. But the situation really is a lot messier. Uh, peptides get broken down into dipeptides and tripeptides, and you need very general transporters that can take up those amino acids uh, and absorb them and use them. And so this PEPT1 is the main one that does that. Um, and so what we found uh, through, we have data both in, in, in a whole range of different organisms that support this now, uh, but I'll show you the mouse data. We treat the mice for two weeks with gemfibrazil, remove the intestine, and use a fluorescent dipeptide to look at uptake in the intestine. And what we find on the top uh, right is that uh, if you add gemfibrazil either at a low or the high dose that I showed you that affects frailty, you can reduce uptake of dipeptides. Interestingly, the positive control for this is losartan, which is a, a the, so this dipeptide transporter is an off-target uh, for losartan as well, which might be intriguing. I think the more interesting finding, though, is that to, if you look at the animals after two weeks on gemfibrazil, you can see about a 15% reduction in essential amino acids in the muscle. And that's a significant effect. It looks small, but um, you know, if you take amino acids down by 10 or 15%, you're going to see effects of that. Now, we know that amino acid restriction can extend lifespan. And so one model for what's happening here is that we're reducing amino acid uptake uh, and that's mimicking the effects of amino acid restriction. So that's something we're looking into. Uh, and coming back to mTOR, gemfibrazil also affects the mTOR pathway because if you block amino acid uh, in, in uptake in cells, amino acids are a major activator of TORC1. And you can see that on the right. So if you look under the, on the slide, I'll try to take you through it. Under starved conditions, you have very low phosphorylation of S6 kinase, which is a target of mTOR kinase. Uh, if you add just general amino acids, you get activation of mTOR, and that's not inhibited by gemfibrazil. If you add leucine, you can get activation of mTOR, and that's also not inhibited by gemfibrazil. But if you add dipeptides to the media, then you don't see the activation of mTOR in the presence of gemfibrazil. So this is a very, I think, clear indication of what this drug is doing in cell culture. And so this uh, led us to think a little bit about old drugs. And what we've decided to do is a project to try to make old drugs young again. And I'll tell you how we're going about that. So gemfibrazil, uh, widely used drug, PPAR alpha, in our, at least in, uh, we strongly believe that's not the target of the drug. Uh, instead, we found this dipeptide transporter and we found two other targets in, in lipid metabolism that we think might underlie the hypertriglyceridemia uh, phenotypes. Uh, and we're looking at that now. And so the idea is that if you have a drug, and it, even if it's been approved and used, but you don't know the targets, you haven't optimized the drug. Uh, and if you can identify the real targets of the drug, you can then test derivatives of the drug that are better adapted at hitting the individual targets. And that'll create new chemical entities that you can use for diseases or aging in the future. So we think this is, this is what we're doing for Jim Fribrazil. We're actually starting a company to look at this. And um, if you're interested, talk to me. I think the idea is to um, 
find drugs that specifically hit each of the three targets we've identified or differentially hit those targets. And there's a wide range of indications that can be explored. But that also leaves the question of how many old drugs have the wrong or unknown targets. And it's a surprising number. I would guess in a brief literature review that maybe 10 or even 20% of drugs that are approved near off patent or off patent we don't know the real target of them. And we now have the technologies to look at that using things like SETSA much better than was what we could do in the 80s and 90s when a lot of these drugs were identified. And so we've, I've, decided, I've started working with Owen Phillips, who you might know because he's CEO of BrainKey, another company, uh, and we think we can use AI to prioritize drugs that, uh, one, we don't likely know the real target of, Two, have disease indications or aging uh, links that are very interesting and have drug-like properties and good safety profiles. And so we, we actually think we can find a lot of different drugs out there that fall under this classification like gemfibrozil. Uh, so the broader concept is to take gemfibrozil derivatives as a lead program, but realize that there are a lot of other drugs that have that, strat have that problem. And if we use AI strategies, we can probably predict the ones that are mistargeted. Uh, the current technologies really help us identify the correct targets. We like longevity drugs, even if you're looking at disease, because I think that if they can affect longevity, that there's probably a higher number of disease indications they can be used for. And that derivatives of old drugs that have good safety profiles are more likely to be safe. You still have to test them, but they're somewhat de-risk when you start the experiment. So that's kind of how we're approaching this now. Uh, I want to go on and talk a little bit about uh, AKG. I'm just going to show two slides. Uh, this is something we've worked on for a long time uh, and with a company called PDL Health uh, to try to identify combinations of natural products that affect longevity. Uh, and we have a, a lot of mouse data, so including a lot that's unpublished. We think we're beginning to understand the mechanism of action with regard to aging. Um, but I want to use uh, human data just to make a point that uh, is is not being discussed a whole lot yet, and that's this is uh, people that use the product for an average of seven months, not a placebo-controlled study, and what we found is in general, using a relatively simple biologic age methylation test, the individuals got about six years younger after seven months on the treatment. Um, now, there was no placebo, and I do believe there's a placebo effect on biologic age. If you're spending $100 a month to try to be younger, you're probably a little bit younger. Um, <laughs> Not, but this was a big effect, so hopefully it's a combination of the product and the placebo. Uh, but the, the more important point I want to make is that we saw a very uh, clear uh, relationship in who responded uh, to, to this particular intervention. And it was people that were chronologically older and also people that were biologically older than their chronologic age. And so in other words, people that are not aging particularly well are the ones that seem to respond in this intervention. And I, and I bring this up because, you know, as we go forward and start testing human interventions more, I think we're going to find a lot of uh, personalization happening. Some people will respond to some interventions, some people to others. It may be sex dependent. It may be the current state of their aging dependent. It may be how they're aging. And we really need to not just test interventions, but ultimately understand which interventions are going to work in which people. And that's something that the field is just starting to, to address, I think.